for our scriptural setting tonight, I would like to call your attention to the second chapter of First Corinthian letter. Paul writing to the Corinthian saints, and as we're going to talk about testimonies tonight, I think that this uh, particular chapter brings to us something of the testimony that Paul had, and as he spoke of in his uh, writing to the Corinthian saints. And I, brethren, when I come to you, come not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determine not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered the hearts of man the things that God hath prepared for them that loved him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but by the spirit of God. Now we have received the, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given us of God, which things also we speak not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing the spiritual things with the spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for their foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they're spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he might instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It is with a great deal of pleasure we come again tonight, and I'm happy to see you here. I know there's not quite as many here as there were last night, but I can tell, I know the reason why, because I'm sure that many of them were not able to come because of the inclement weather or the rain. But I'm glad that you've raised the storm. And I hope that in our coming together tonight that we might receive some light, inspiration, and some help that will stimulate us to a greater spirit of usefulness in the building of the kingdom of God. Tonight we wanted to talk about the testimonies of Jesus. I have been using in my series of meetings for the last few number of uh, months, uh, and over a year rather, because of the fact of the experience that came across my observation, I have been using the testimonies, bearing my testimony uh, on the Wednesday evening because it is prayer evening, and it's the evening that we usually give our testimonies from time to time in our, our prayer meetings. And I came to this uh, conclusion some few years ago when I was holding a series of meetings in Moline, Illinois. We were having a very enjoyable series, uh, that is, when we made plans for the series, the pastor asked me about having a testimony of prayer meeting on Wednesday night rather than a preaching service. Well, I thought at first that doesn't sound too good, that I'd rather go ahead with the the missionary meetings each evening. But I thought that, well, this would be a fine thing to give attention to this. And I said, all right, I'll be happy to do this. And we, each Wednesday, and I was there for two weeks, and that each Wednesday evening we'd have a prayer and testimony meeting as we do every Wednesday night. And during this particular time that there was a very fine lady who uh, invited numbers of non-member friends at her house each evening after service. And those uh, people would come, and uh, they would, she had a large table and uh, seated a number of them around, and sometimes there would be 15 or 20 non-members, and then she would let me ask, answer the questions and, and then promote them, uh, actually, conversation, that they would come to a better knowledge and understanding of the gospel. And they'd have the opportunity to ask me something of the sermon that I preached that night. 
And uh, during this particular time, our first Wednesday evening, we had a large group of non-members in attendance, and they came to the Wednesday night prayer meeting. And the second prayer meeting, they were there also. On Thursday night of the last uh, uh, week of the sermons, there was a man and his family. This man was an automobile agent there in Moline who uh, had uh, become acquainted with one of the men of the church, and so he had uh, promised that he would come to one of the series of meetings. So he asked uh, the, our, the, his, uh, the member friend, he says, well, what night would you like for me to come? He said, we'd like you to come on Sunday night at the beginning. So he came Sunday night, and he continued to come throughout the whole services. He was there for the Wednesday night prayer meetings, and on the, the last prayer meeting and the next Thursday evening as we were in this uh, home, after the, we had finished our conversation with them and we started to leave the table, he came to me and he said, Brother Renfro, he said, I want to be baptized into church. He said, I received the greatest light and inspiration, not only out of the sermons, but he says that the testimonies of those people that I've dealt with and know them to be true Latter-day Saints and honest people, he says, when I heard them bear their testimony, it said, it just touched my heart deeply. And I felt that I would like to become a member of this church because of that testimony. I don't know whether my wife and three teenage girls will be baptized or not, but I do want to give my name here to, to this evening. And it just thrilled my soul. Then the next Sunday morning at the uh, Sunday school, uh, Sister Royce was teaching the Sunday school class, and that was the home in which uh, we were having these meetings uh, each evening after services, and I was staying in this home. This Sunday morning, she began to, in her class, the wife of this man and his three teenage daughters attended this uh, class that morning, and they asked a number of questions, and at the close of this, they came to Sister Royce and they said, uh, Sister Royce, we too would like to become members of the church as a result of the testimonies of the saints and the ministry that we were able to present five people in one family uniting a family circle was added to the church and to me that was a rich experience and since that time that I've been talking on testimonies on each Wednesday evening as I would like to talk about tonight but by way of beginning I would like to use the text of scripture that I had in my scripture lesson, and I would like for you to think of this as we do present this statement that is made by Paul. Where Paul said that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but by the Spirit of God. The things of God are known by the Spirit of God. And it's so important that a person must come in possession of that Spirit in order to know the things of God. And that's why that tonight that we're in this particular service, that you might feel the presence of God and know something of the Spirit of God that you will know the things of God as you come in possession of this Spirit. Now, this is important. It's important in your life. It's important to me. For without the Spirit of God and the testimony of Jesus, we would have very little. We would have nothing. And then that brings me to the second text, which is in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelations and the 10th verse, where John the Revelator made this statement. He said that I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant unto the brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He who has the testimony that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that's prophetic. Spirit of prophecy. The testimony of Jesus spirit of prophecy. Now, if you've had that testimony, you've had prophecy. It's revealed. I know that there are great numbers of people that are baptized into the church, and they have received a testimony 
before baptism. That testimony that has caused them to move out and actually decide to make their covenant relationship with Christ. They received that testimony before baptism. And that's a marvelous thing. And there I've known people that have received the testimony and have borne witness of it, and yet they wouldn't unite with the church. And they died outside the church. And that's bad. But it's marvelous when people accept and obey when they receive that testimony. And then there are those of us that have received the testimony of Jesus because of some person who bore witness in our heart and life and caused us to recognize the divinity of Christ and the greatness of Christ and that we decided that we'd like to be baptized because of the testimony in our believing in those that bore testimony. Now I could say that that was in my life. My mother, who was the first of our family to become, member, uh, to become a member of the church, she converted my father, and my father became a missionary. And day after day, and month after month, as we would work there in our home, at evening time, when we'd come around the family altar, and we would listen as my mother would bear her testimony of the divinity of the church, before that we would offer the evening prayers, the family prayers. And family prayer is very important because it does great things for the children, it does great things for the parents because we have a better understanding of our children when we hear them petition the throne of God, asking God to help them to overcome some imperfection, asking him to help them and guide them as they go among their fellows. We can get up from our knees when we hear them say it, we offer those kind of prayers and that we can assist them and making such adjustments as are necessary and they need to make adjustments today and then too as the parents they have their problems and as they offer their petition to god the children understand something of the conditions of the home and they will arise from their knees and assist in making such adjustments as are necessary so the great value in family prayer and my mother knew that and she, each evening, we would have the family circle together. When father was home, he would come in out of the mission field and we would be grateful to see him come. Because that we, know, that we knew that he had a testimony and he was going to bear his testimony of that which had come across his observation during his personal ministry. And that he met a lot of opposition. But oh, how he loved to serve the Lord even in opposition. Even in adversity, conditions were so adverse that he could hardly uh, bear, the, but, the, but he continued on. And he would come home, and when he would bear his testimony about the goodness of God and how that God had guided and directed him in his ministry, it thrilled my soul. And through those testimonies, I was baptized. But mind you that after baptism, and when the confirmation came, hands were laid on me for the gift of the Holy Spirit. There come to me a greater witnessing power, something that I'd never had before, but it was something that was important in my life. The testimony of Jesus gave, which was the spirit of prophecy, prophetic. And that came as a result, and that comes by revelation. Revelation is very important. The Apostle Paul said this as he was writing to the Ephesian saints in the first chapter of the 17th verse. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened, that you'll know what is the hope of your calling, in order that we might know the hope of our calling. There must come to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. And without that spirit of wisdom and revelation, we wouldn't have a knowledge of God. It must be. And so revelation is so important. 
Jesus made this clear too. When he was writing, as is recorded in the 17th chapter of the gospel as recorded by the apostle John in the third verse, when Jesus here had prayed this beautiful prayer, and this is what he said. He said, and this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom God has sent. Life eternal depends upon our knowledge of God. And without revelation, we could not have eternal life according to Jesus. For eternal life depends upon this revelation of light. And Jesus made that more clearly when he was writing in these, uh, the... Uh, 11th chapter of Matthew in the 25th verse when he says at that time Jesus answered and said I thank thee O Lord heaven and earth because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and hath revealed them unto babes even so father for so it seemeth good in thy sight all things are delivered unto me of my father and no man knoweth the, fa the son but the father neither knoweth any man the the Father save the Son and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Who's going to know God in Christ? Well, it's to be revealed. It's a revelation of light. And Jesus Christ is the author of this statement. And so the revelation of Jesus Christ must come into your heart and into my life if we are to know God and to know Christ. A revelation of God. Now this revelation came, I say, as it was revealed by Christ. And also there is another statement of that of Paul that I would like to bring that will, uh, to, and in order to get to the points that we want to this evening in our testimonial part. The Apostle Paul, you remember, was a church persecutor. He had persecuted the saints and he had gone from place to place and he had brought them in bound and placed them in prison testified against them and in the case of Stephen he stoned him to death Paul held the coats of those that stoned Stephen and while there he saw no doubt and he heard the things that Stephen said as he was actually passing from this page of life for it says that he looked up just before he passed away and he said Lord lay not this to their charge all most of the same words that was given by Jesus when they were crucifying him Jesus says, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Stephen said almost the same thing. And then he heard Stephen as he said, he saw the heavens open. And he saw Jesus Christ sitting on the right hand of God. He saw the Christ. He said, Stephen said, as he sitting on the right hand of God. But Paul continued his persecution of the saints, even after this experience. He started on the road to Damascus, as is recorded in the 26th chapter of Acts of the Apostles, the 13th verse, and it said it was about midday, and I'm just going to paraphrase the story. It said he was struck down by the power of God. And there was a voice from heaven that said, Saul, why persecute me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. Paul saw Jesus Christ. Paul heard the voice of Jesus. And the memory of both became an abiding influence in his life. Who art thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And then Paul said, what will you have me to do? And he says, you go to Damascus, and it shall be told thee what to do. And the record says that this man turned, he went to Damascus, blinded. But the Lord said something else to him. And this is what I want you to know particularly tonight. He said, I have appeared unto thee for a purpose. Now what was the purpose of his appearing unto Paul? To make thee a witness and a minister of those things which thou hast seen and those things which thou hast heard. That was the object of his appearance that this man would be a witness of those things that he had seen and those things which he had heard. And then here to start a little farther, he said this, 
and those things which shall appear unto thee hereafter. It didn't end there. But he was to be endowed with spiritual power after that he had received this first messenger. The message of Jesus. Now that's important. For a witness of the things they've seen, the things that we've heard, I'm sure that many of you have seen that many of you have heard, and many of you could bear witness of that which you have seen and heard. And then that's not the only thing that's important, to recognize the things that are going to appear unto you hereafter. That's important. And that's what Paul received. And as a result of that which appeared to him, there were 13 epistles written by Paul that tonight that we could open the New Testament, we could read those epistles where the Paul, as he worked with God and as he sought him for divine guidance, that grace and peace was given to him as he continued in his ministry. What a marvelous thing to follow the leadings of Christ and to follow the leadings of the Spirit. And that's what he did. And this is what he received as a result of following the spiritual manifestations of God. Tonight, if I were to give you paper and pencil, I'm sure that many of you, if I would say that I would like to have you to bear a testimony, I know that many of you would have a marvelous testimony. I heard Brother Blue's testimony at South Chrysler Church. It thrilled my soul. If that's in public, if that had that, if you write that out, if you would write out your testimony tonight, and that we had those testimonies here compiled, it would be comparable of the Acts of the Apostles. Because I'm sure that you've had rich experiences with God. And what a marvelous thing it would be that you could bear that testimony and bear witness. And that if we had those all compiled, it would be of great advantage to us, wouldn't it? And that's what Luke did in writing the testimonies of Paul and other men who served the Lord. And we too, I say, could have those testimonies. But because of the fact of the time of having each one to bear his testimony tonight, that I want to relate a few testimonies or experiences that have come across my observation that have caused me to recognize the divinity of Christ in this work. Wives well, felt it before, but I mean that it actually brings great power into my heart and life. And it gives me a yearning that I want to go out to bring this and bear this testimony to others. That they too might feel what I felt. That they might see what I've seen. And that they might have the joy that I've had when I've seen people brought to a knowledge of the gospel of Christ. And I'm sure that you've had that experience too. Some few years ago, I was in Paris, Tennessee. I was there for a reunion. It was a very, uh, uh, of course, at that time, they didn't have any facilities, and they held a reunion in the city of Paris in the auditorium, the city auditorium. It was a very uh, large auditorium, that seated a large group of people and we had uh, advertised throughout the papers and in the town that we were going to hold this evening services and it would be a preaching service. And they'd asked me to give these sermons each evening at this reunion. And I, I'm reminded that after we had got underway, we had around 250 uh, on an average of non-members coming every night, which was a very marvelous uh, crowd a marvelous attendance, rather. But anyway, this particular evening, I had an impression that there was someone there who was under conviction. Now, I've had that a number of times, and, of course, it has come where that there would be a large crowds like that, large attendance or a large congregation that you just couldn't actually select out those that were under conviction. Maybe you would see one or two, but you wouldn't be able to select all of them out. So I have given invitations many times asking people if they would like to make their commitment to Christ. 
just as I do many times in prayer meetings, ask our saints to make their commitment to Christ. It's important to ask people. And so this particular evening, I asked, I said, that uh, we're going to, at the close of this service, we'd have Brother Breckenridge. Now, because of the arrangements of the stage, I couldn't get down to the front. I had to go outside and come around, but the, it was, the stage was high, four feet high, no steps. So Brother Breckenridge, who was assisting in this reunion, or was uh, working with me in the reunion, he was sitting down near the front, and I told him that Brother Breckenridge would stand, and if there's anybody that would like to unite with the church, they could come down and talk to Brother Breckenridge, or if they wanted to talk about their soul salvation, we'd be happy for them to come and talk to Brother Breckenridge, and that we would talk with them later, too. And so at the close of the service, I went around and shook hands with the people, and Brother Breckenridge stood down at the front. There was a young couple that come down, a young man and a young girl. They were going together as friends, and uh, this young man had never had any church affiliation, or he had never attended church very much. But then he came down and said to Brother Breckenridge that, you know, he said, I received a marvelous spirit here tonight, something different from anything that I've ever had before. And he said, I, I, I wanted to talk about it. And so Brother Breckenridge motioned for me to come down and after everyone had left, and I came down and talked with him, and he's telling me about how, and he says, you know, I feel like that I'd like to become a part of this, a movement, this movement. I'd like to unite with the church. I said, well, we're holding a reunion here. Of course, he said that I need to know more about it. I said, we're holding a reunion. Now, in the morning, if you'll come down to the prayer meeting at 830, and that if you desire to understand more about the church, attend the classes each day, and that we'll have opportunity to talk with you, answer your questions, and help you to sense and to know the things that you need to do. And I said, if you would like to do that, we'd be happy to have you. And he said, well, I'd like to do it. I'm not doing anything. I don't have a job. I could very easily do that. And so that he left, and the next morning, he came to the prayer service. He offered a prayer. It wasn't so well worded as some of us who pray more often, but it did have spiritual power. And it really touched the hearts of all the people there at this reunion. And there was about 145 saints there. After his, t after his prayer, we entered into the testimonial part of the service, and he arose to bear his testimony, and he told about the experience that evening, that he had had a feeling that this was the true church. And he said that we, I expressed that to the two ministers here last night. But he said, I went home and I told my parents about the experience that I had. And my father said, well, if I were you, I'd follow through on this. Uh, the Lord is touching at your, uh, tugging at your heart, and you must move in and do what you think is right. And he said, be careful and move slowly. And he said, you know, that after I talked to my father, and his father was the vice president of the bank, and he says, after I talked to my father, he said, I went upstairs to bed, and during the night, he says, I had the most rich experience. Someone came into my room, and that he told me that the church was true and that I should accept it, that I should seek diligently for this. And so when he was telling this, he just wept. At the close of that service, he came down to the front, and as we talked with him, as he wanted to learn more about the church, and as we talked with him, there was other young people, because of the whole congregation, they were all in tears, and there came down that evening, that morning, 13 more young people who gave their names for baptism. Now those young people, they lived, they were children of the saints who had lived in isolation. And they had never accepted Christ. But as a result of this testimony of that young man, he was an instrument in the hands of the Lord in bringing 13 other young people to a knowledge of the gospel. God moves in mysterious ways. He moves upon people. And when he moves, we need to move under that power and spirit. 
This young man, he followed us through this, and at the close of the reunion, he was baptized. And I made this statement many times, that if this young man didn't prove faithful and true to the trust that he'd made with Christ, he was an instrument of the hands of the Lord in bringing those 13 other young people to a knowledge of the law of God. I gave this testimony at a reunion down in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Immediately following the reunion, they, that service, a young man, well, he was in his 30s, he came walking down, and that was just a short time ago, walking down, he said, Brother Renfro, would you remember me? And I said, no, I don't. I don't believe I do. And he says, well, I'm one of those young men that was baptized that, as a result of this man's testimony. I was one of them, and there's, he says, there's five of those young men that hold the priesthood of the church. And this young man is true and faithful to the trust that he made with Christ. A testimony of Jesus. It's a spirit of prophecy. It was prophetic. Last, a few years ago, I was in a series of meetings out at the reunion at the Center State Reunion. She said, I want to talk some more. And I said, well, we'll be happy to talk with you anytime. And she said, well, how about coming to your home? And I said, that's fine. You come anytime. After we were home, well, probably a couple of weeks, we had a telephone call that she wanted to come over. And so she and her daughter came over. And we had a very fine conversation that afternoon. And when we come to the close of this conversation, I bore my testimony of the divinity of the Christ. And she was in tears, and she said, Brother Enfro, I've never felt this way before. There's a spirit here that I have never felt before in my life. I want to know more about it. It took Brother Schaefer two years to bring that soul to the kingdom, but she came into the kingdom of God, and she's made a marvelous contribution to the cause of the Christ because she received the revelation of Jesus Christ. And she has made her contribution. Some few years ago, and it's been many years ago, is during the time that I was in the provinces of Canada as a missionary, I was home during the Christmas holidays one time, and there was uh, Brother Eddie Butterworth, as most of you, many of you know Brother Butterworth. He is a man who usually makes a lot of beautiful materials for missionaries, and he's a very fine minister. He told me that he had some materials, and at that time I was the senior president of the President's Society, and he said, I've got some materials that I'd like very much for you to see, because I think that if we could uh, use, it could be used by the missionaries, and particularly those of the local congregations. And I said, well, I'd be very glad to see these, uh, these uh, uh, materials that you have. He said, well, I'll meet you here in the morning at 8 o'clock. He said, I have to leave uh, right after that, but I'd like to talk with you in the morning. And I said, well, you come at 8 o'clock. And when I arrived that morning, I got there at 8 o'clock, but the door was open into the office, and uh, Brother Butterworth was sitting inside, and there was another gentleman sitting in there with him. And as I came in, Brother Butterworth introduced me to this man and said that Brother Smith had sent, Brother Israel A. Smith had sent this man, Kaywood, his name was uh, Charles Kaywood, back that he wanted him to talk, he wanted to talk to me about the soul, about his soul salvation. Said that he was a Baptist minister of, uh, from Gentry, Arkansas, as a pastor of a congregation. And said that he wanted to talk. And I said, well, I'll be very happy to talk with him. And so, uh, Brother Butterworth said, well, before the conversation with you and he, I'd like very much to present my materials. And I said, that's fine. So he, on a table, he started uh, presenting those plaques that he had. There was beautiful plaques that he had arranged. And this was the biblical background of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Going back in the old scriptures, showing that the Book of Mormon was to come. And that he brought all of those beautiful statements concerning the Book of Mormon, as we find in the scripture. And then he talked a great deal about the Book of Mormon. This man asked a lot of questions while he was giving his lecture for an hour and ten minutes. He lectured. When he had finished, uh, Brother Butterworth put his things away and he left the room. And this man said to me, Brother Kaywood said, Well, Brother Infro, you see, that's the first elder that I've ever heard talk. And we started in conversation. 
and we talked until noon. And this man asked question after question about the divinity of the church, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, and he was well versed. And I said to him that you've never heard any of our ministers. How do you come in possession of all this knowledge? We came to this particular moment at the end of this noon, and they said, I said to him, I'd have taken him out for lunch, but I wanted to talk to Brother Smith. And so I told him that I was going home at lunch, and I'd be back at 1 o'clock, and if he wanted to continue, our conversation will begin again. He said, well, I'll be here at 1. I went home, and I talked to Brother Smith, and he said, yes, I believe that he is investigating. And he said that I would like very much for you, when you finish talking with him, to take him up and let him talk to Brother Wallace and Brother Edwards, who were in the presidency. And he said, I'd like for them to talk with him too. And I said, all right. And he says, I'll call them and tell them to get in touch with you. And so that afternoon, when I left the house, going back to uh, my son, Jim, who was a missionary at that time at the church, he wanted to go with me. He said, I'd like to hear this conversation this afternoon. I said, well, come along. He came and he sat through this afternoon session and for two and a half hours we continued on this question and answers. And when we came to the end, he said, now Brother Renfro, I'm convinced. He said, I'm convinced that this is the church. And he said, but I have a problem. And they said, I'd like to get your viewpoints on this. Should I be baptized while I'm here? But he says, I have my people in a building program. Or should I go back and finish off the building and then be baptized? I said, well, do you, don't, do you have anybody else that could go in and finish off the building as know about it? He says, no, there isn't. Well, I said, by all means, go back and finish the building. And then when you finish the building, that you explain to the people why that you're going to make this move. And I said, they will think more of you. And I think it will be better. And I said, now, how did you come in possession of all this knowledge? You said you didn't hear anyone, you never heard one of our ministers till this morning. Well, he said many years ago, and I'd like for the young people to think about this. Many years ago, he says, you know, that my brother was going with an RLDS girl in Oklahoma. And this girl that he was going with, they became quite serious. And this girl felt that uh, there's one thing that she wanted him to understand, that she wasn't going to change her church. And that he'd like for him to know about her church. He didn't, says, I didn't, she didn't ask him to join, unite with the church, but said, I want him to know about it. Because that he must not oppose that which I believe in. And he says, I want to know that before. And so he says that this girl gave my brother a Book of Mormon and some other books. And my brother read it. And when he had read this Book of Mormon, he received such light and inspiration in it that he said that, now my, my brother's a minister of the Baptist Church and I want him to have this because I think it'll do him good. And so he went to him and told him, he said, now, I'd like you to take this book. Now, I'm giving it to you, but I want you to pledge me one thing that you'll read it. Well, he said, I pledged him I'd read it. But he said, you know, I started reading it and then I lost interest and laid it down. I picked it up again, started again, and laid it down, and then soon the book disappeared. And a year or two passed. And said that one day I was browsing up in the attic and I found the book up there. I brought it down, I read the book. And then I found out about the Doctrine and Covenants. And I went a hundred miles, I drove a hundred miles to see this girl that my brother didn't marry, and asked her how I could get in possession of a Doctrine and Covenants. She gave me a Herald catalog, ordered the Doctrine and Covenants, and said, Brother Info, I've made a complete study of the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants, and I find them to be of divine origin. They are testimonies bearing witness of Christ. And he said, that's marvelous. And he said, that's how I came in possession of this. And I thank God for it. I said, now, there's one thing then that I have to say to you. When you come into this church, you will no longer be a minister. You will be a layman. He said, yes, I realize that. But I'm willing to take my chance. We went up to talk to Brother Smith, uh, Wallace Smith and Brother Edwards. And they asked, he asked them the question as to what he should do about the building. And they said, well, by all means, go back and finish it off. And then they said to him, as I said, 
You will, when you become a member of this church, you will no longer be a minister. You'll be a layman. He said, that's what Brother Renfro has told me. And when we got what left that room, he said to me, Brother Renfro, I have never seen men that were so united in thought as you men are in this church. Well, he says, the same testimony came from each one of you. I soon he left and went back to his home. I wrote to Brother Black, who was the missionary in, in Joplin, Missouri. He went down, contacted him, and in May of that year, the building was finished and this man was baptized. After his baptism in October, I came out of Canada in October and was in the present uh, Quorum of Twelve's office and Brother Black was there and he said, Brother Info, I have some good news for you. Of course, I'd had two or three letters from Brother uh, Kaywood. But he says, I have some good news for you. He said, you know, at the last district conference, Brother Kaywood's, name he was called and his name was presented he was ordained an elder in the church i related this testimony just not so long ago in dallas texas in the first church in dallas and at the close of that service a young man come walking down and said brother Enfro, i'm john k wood i too am an elder he was the pastor of the church one of the churches there in dallas richardson congregation and he says, I've heard that testimony before. There was another brother who is a priest of the church. God moves when people move toward him. And these men bear witness of the divinity of the Book of Mormon, as we should bear witness of it. I have another testimony, and I see about time is up, but I want to bring this testimony. Some few, about two years ago, oh, quite two, almost two years ago, not yet two, I was uh, asked to come down the state of Texas. Uh, I first went to Victoria, Texas, and we baptized three people there. And then uh, they asked me to come to uh, San Antonio, where they had built a new church. And they wanted me to begin a series even before the opening of the church. Brother Smith came the week after I held, had my series, and he had the opening service. But we had a thrilling congregation that the church was packed every evening. We baptized ten people. I went from there to Marlin, Texas, where I've done a lot of missionary work in the, in the city of Marlin. And uh, arrangements was made, and those men, they have a large group of priesthood. And those priesthood members are quite actively engaged. They're going somewhere every evening, talking to somebody about the church. They hold cottage meetings. A missionary has no business with a set of slides in that area because those men, they top them on that. They're always doing that work themselves. And all they expect the missionary to do is to come and to close the sale after they have made them. And they make the sales. And at this particular time, I was there for this series of meetings. One of our nurses was nursing in the uh, uh, rest home there in... Uh, and uh, Marlin is just adjacent to the, uh, the veterans hospital and it was a veterans rest home and she was a nurse had been a nurse and she was 80 years of age and this nurse went into her room this nurse is, uh, who was uh, in the hospital in this uh, rest home and the nurse who was uh, attendant there she went into her room and says uh, well Mrs. Bennett how would you like to go to church with me today and she said what church is it she said, well, it's the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And said, our missionary is from Independence, Missouri, Brother Renfro. And she said, oh, I'd love to go. She said, in 1941 and 42, I nursed at the sanitarium in Independence, Missouri. And she said, I went to the second church and then I also went to the stone church and I wanted to unite with it then. But my husband objected to it. Said, I prepared many people for an administration. When the elders would come in, I would prepare them and said it was a beautiful service. And she says, oh, I'd love to go. But says, I'm in a wheelchair. She said, well, that's all right. We'll take you. And so each evening, they brought this good sister and they rolled her down the aisle and she sat there and listened to the sermons. And one afternoon, one evening after the sermon, she said, Brother Renfro, will you come over to the rest home tomorrow? I want to talk with you. And I went over to the rest home to talk to this good sister, and here's what she said. 
She said, now I'm convinced that this is, this is true. She said, I've known this for a long while. But she says, you know, I have a problem. Now, I was baptized by a very fine man into another church. And I want to know, well, I have to be baptized again. And I said, well, I'm going to ask you a question now. And when you answer that question, I think you'll answer the whole thing. When you were baptized by this person, did he tell you that he would lay his hands upon you for the reception of the Holy Spirit? And she said, no, he didn't believe that. Well, I said, no doubt he was honest and sincere. But I'm saying that when you are baptized into this church, then the hands will be laid on you for the reception of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit's power will come into your heart and life to teach you to dedicate all that you are and all that you have to the service of God. I'm telling you that. And she said, well, I figured that that would be what you would say. I knew that's what you would say. But I want to be baptized. They baptized her. And when I came home, I had a letter for her. And this is what she said. She said, when I come to thinking of how near that I came of missing, becoming a member of this church, I shudder. She said, it's the greatest thing that ever come into my life. And you could see it in her very face as you'd visit with her. It was a great day. After Christmas of that uh, year, it was uh, in the year of the conference, General Conference of 70, and at Christmas time, I had another letter from her in January. She said, you know, I've been very ill, Brother Renfro, and said I had a very hard attack of flu and everything, she said seemingly had gone wrong. But she said, the saints were so nice. They were so good to me. They were here every moment of the time. And the elders came. They administered to me. And she says, I am well. I am out of the wheelchair. I am walking. I am coming to the general conference. And I want my patriarchal blessing. I want you to give it when I come. What great things can happen. And how marvelous it was at the general conference that this good sister came to my house, walked up five steps, come in, received her patriarchal blessing at 81 years of age, and in that blessing there was such inspiration given that gave her a renewed effort, something that she could work at and something that she has worked at. And that was, it was stated in the blessing, that she would have this particular task of helping others. And she writes to the soldiers in service. She bought her a typewriter, and she keeps busy. And she said, it's the greatest joy that ever come into my life. And when I went to the hospital the last time I was there, I went to see her, and she says, this is the greatest thing. How marvelous this is. Not only was she baptized, but there was, it was 16 with her baptized during that series of meetings. Another family of five united with the church. God moves in mysterious ways. He desires that people would make their covenant relationship with him. I know that a lot of times people feel, well, they'd like to have the testimony before they're baptized, but the Lord didn't say that. He said, he that doeth the will of the Father shall know. If you want to know, then you must do his will, and you will know. You won't have to guess. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. If you want that, we offer it. And God will richly bless you if you make your covenant relationship with him. May the blessings of heaven be yours tomorrow evening. We invite you back. We're going to talk about by the water you keep the commandments. And the next evening we're going to say by the spirit you're justified. And oh, if we had the time, by the blood you're sanctified. There's the commandments, justification, sanctification. And that's what we want to talk about tomorrow night and Friday night. We invite you back. Bring your friends.